Hi class, welcome to the next chapter, chapter eight. In chapter eight, we are going to be talking about applications of integrals. Our first section, chapter 8.1, is gonna talk about areas between curves. So what we're gonna have here is we'll have two or more functions, and we'll just look at the space uh, that they enclose and try to find the area of that space. So let's go ahead and begin. So the area, which we will call A, of a region that is bounded by the curves, our first curve being y equals f of x. The second we will call g of x. Um, and the lines x equals A and x equals B. So these points, uh, these lines x equals A and x equals B, these are our bounds, where f and g are continuous and we will say that f is the larger function for every single x inside of this interval from a to b. We can find this area by taking the integral from a to b, right, from our starting point to our ending point, by looking at the difference between f of x and g of x. So remember here, f is always larger than g, so f is always on top of g. So if we subtract those two, it'll just give us the space in between. Okay. We can use the law of uh, distribution of integrals, and we can distribute this integral across the subtraction sign. And we can think of this as two uh, separate integrals that we are finding, or maybe it's easier to just subtract the functions and integrate that, right? So there's different ways of looking at this. And so the star here is that we're really looking at the area under F minus the area under G. Okay, so if we go through an example here, I have um, my axes X and Y. I'm going to have some curve F, some curve G. Now here you can see there's a portion where G is larger than F. So my bounds should be from A to B where F is always on top, okay, according to this definition. Now, obviously, when we get into practice, we get to change this around a little bit. And so I'm bounding from A to B. And this area in between is the area between my curves that I'm interested in. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a quick example. So let's find the area bounded by y equals x squared and y equals 4x minus x squared. There's no interval given here, so we are going to find the intersection of these two functions and look at the area that is bounded between them. So this uh, interval that we find, these two points of intersection, is going to be our um, interval for integration. We need to also figure out which function is larger, right? So is x squared larger than uh, 4x minus x squared, or vice versa, over these points of intersection. So an easy way to do this, obviously, is to kind of draw a graph. Um, it's hard to kind of just visualize this unless you're really good at algebra and graphing. Um, so let's kind of use our knowledge of quadratics to get a general idea. I don't need to plot every single point. Um, obviously, you can do something like go to Desmos. But we should be able to have enough mathematical intuition to just quickly, quickly draw a generalized graph. So <clears throat> I know x squared is a parabola. I know that it's centered at the origin. And I know that it's concave up. It opens upward, right? It's a bull. If I look at 4x minus x squared, well, the negative term is in front of x squared. So it is also a parabola, but it is concave down. So one of these is like a mountain. One of these is like a valley, um, and this function is shifted in some way because it has this 4x attached to it as well. So they should be offset a little bit, okay? So if I do a little bit of math and I factor out a negative x, I get negative x times x minus 4. This tells me that the zeros of this quadratic is x equals 0 and x equals 4, okay? So my parabola is concave down and I have zeros at 0 and 4. I know for my first function it's centered at the origin so there's only one zero at the origin so they have a shared zero. Okay, 
Now, I don't know where these two functions intersect. I do know one point, x equals zero, because it's a shared zero, but I don't know where they intersect. So if I do a rough graph, my first parabola is just a parabola concave up at zero. This uh, second function is concave down, has one zero at the origin, and the other zero at x equals four. Okay, so it'll look like something like this. So now it makes sense for me to say, oh, the area bounded by these two functions. It's obviously this little sliver here um, that's trapped in between that these, these two overlapping uh, regions create. So now that I have a generalized idea, I know that my bounds should be zero and some other point. I am going to go ahead and set these functions equal to each other so I can find this last point of equality of intersection so that I have the bounds for my integral. So I have x squared equals 4x minus x squared. If I start to move things around, let's say I zero out the entire equation. So I can either minus x squared on both sides or add x squared on both sides. Um, it's probably, I like keeping x squared positive. So I just move everything to the left hand side. I have 2x squared minus 4x equals zero. So now I want a factor, I can pull out a 2x. Okay, and we see that one of the zeros is zero and the other zero is positive two, right? Once I have my factored form. So my bounds should be x equals zero. And this intersection happens when x equals two. Okay, so my zeros are zero and two. So we integrate from those points from zero to two, my lower bounds and my upper bounds. Since the interval where the space is bounded by our functions, only exist on that closed interval. So again, if we go backwards from zero to two is where this bounded region exists. Okay, my larger function is four X minus X squared. It is the, for this region of interest, it is the part that's on top, right? The function on top is the concave down function. The region, um, the function on bottom is the standard X squared parabola. So my f function I will consider as 4x minus x squared. So I'm going to subtract x squared from this function, and I can just throw it all into an integral, right? So I have f of x is 4x minus x squared. I will subtract my smaller function over the interval x equals 0 to x equals 2. If I do some quick math, uh, this should actually look pretty similar to what I have here, right? I don't every step for you guys. So I'll have 4x minus 2x squared. If I pull out the common term of negative 2, I'm left with x squared minus 2x. Okay, I can't pull out the common term of x because we're integrating, right? That has to be inside the integral. If you need to take an extra step, go ahead and write this on your paper. You could write the extra integral here, but this is calculus 2, so there will be some steps, some algebraic steps that we skip through. Um, but they will get talked about in these videos, right? So the intermediate step here would just be simplifying this function and then factoring out the common term of negative two, which I've done here, okay? So now this is fairly easy to integrate. It's just a standard polynomial that we need to integrate. So this turns into uh, one third and this turns into uh, one half with the negative two in front. So I have my negative two in front this turns into one-third x squared. Here, the twos cancel, this one-half that comes down, and so I just have this x squared. I am evaluating from two to zero. Uh, notice that since there's nothing but x's on the inside here, when I plug in the zero term, I get nothing. So I really only have to plug in my first value here of two in order to get my answer. So I have negative two times, well, two to the cubed is eight. So eight times negative two is negative 16 over three. And here I have uh, two squared, which is four times my negative two will give me a positive eight, okay? Now, in order for me to simplify this more, I need a common um, denominator. So this should be 24 over three and 24 minus 16 should give me eight. My final value here is eight over three. So if we look at what this looks like on a graph, okay, 
Here is my x squared function. Okay. Here is my 4x minus x squared function. These are my two points of intersection, one at x equals 0, one at x equals 2. Notice I didn't really care what the y value was here. I never had to use that anywhere. I never had to plug in x equals 2 or x equals 0 in order to do this integral, this integration. Um, right. So again, what we're doing is here I made a rough sketch. And just to show you guys what's going on, we're doing a nice little breakdown with an actual graph. Right. So here's my parabola of x squared. Here is my uh, shifted parabola of 4x minus x squared. We're looking at the points in the middle. So the next thing I had to do was find the points of intersection. And then my integral will give me this area, right, where I'm subtracting the area of the top function or the bottom function from the top function. That leaves me with this in the middle. So what we were doing for the setup was any sub x interval we think about our Riemann sums that we use in order to create integrals will be just the function height, right? So the function height of f minus the function height of g will give me a function height that's in the middle. Okay? That's how I find this height right here. Remember, we take ourselves a bar of infinitesimally small width. So we call this delta x. The height of this bar is going to be um, x squared minus 4x minus x squared, which gives us the value 4x minus 2x squared, which again, I then um, did a little bit of math on to get from here to here. Okay, to get to this value, I factored out that negative 2. Okay. So when I subtract x squared from 4x minus x squared, this is the value that you should find out. And then before we integrate it, I just factored out a negative 2. So that is the height of this function, okay? And so when we look at the area, it's the limit as n goes into infinity of the sum of the bars over this interval, okay? So f minus g, so that gives me the height. Delta x is the width, and I'm summing all of these up as my n value goes to infinity. So these bars get smaller and smaller and smaller until they have no width. And then that just gives me the area. Um, and so this is just equating what we we're doing before with the limits of a sum and how that is equal to our integral value, right? So when we break down these integrals, this is how we're gonna do it. We're always gonna take a slice um, and we're gonna look at the rectangle or an area. And then we're gonna sum that as these widths go to um, get very, 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 very small. Okay. okay, so let's do another example. Let's find the area of the region bound between the curves x equals 2 y squared and x equals 4 plus y squared. So if you look at this, this is a little different than the other function. Uh, this may be our first time looking at a function in y rather than x, right? So here you see I, I have x equals something with y mixed in. I have x equals something with y mixed in rather than y equals x squared or y equals some other function of x like we're used to. So the way that we do this is pretty much the same thing. So let's walk through this one thing at a time. So for the steps, again, we want to find the points of intersection. We want to draw a picture uh, because if we find the points first and then draw a picture, it's easier to label the important parts. So again, remember when I did this graph, I wasn't drawing everything, just the important stuff, right? It was easy for me to find the zeros. Um, I didn't know the vertex here or anything like that, but I could draw a good enough graph. Um, so we're basically going to do the same thing here. We want to draw a picture and then wherever they are equal to each other, we'll already know that because we found it first. So it gives us a little bit more stuff to play with when we start to want to graph. Um, so a rough sketch with important things labeled. So one of those important things being those points of intersection. Okay. Then what we're going to do after that is we form our integral and we do our actual calculation and integrate. Okay. So first thing first, I'm going to find my points of intersection. So I have x equals this thing, x equals that thing. 
So I set those two things equal, right? It wouldn't really make sense for me to set this equal to y and set this equal to y and then set them equal. Um, here, if I did that, I would have to say, I'd have to divide by two on both sides and then square root both sides. Very, very similar thing here. That would just kind of make it more convoluted. Here, x is this, x is that. I want the points of intersection, so I'm gonna look for those points of intersection, right? Uh, set those things equal. We can, again, set this equal to zero, move one side to the other. It'll probably, uh, it would be easier to move this side over, but I like keeping things positive. So I'll probably move y squared and the four over to the left-hand side. Okay, so first things first, I'm gonna subtract y on both sides and then subtract, um, well, actually I don't have to subtract four because I can just take the square root. So these two functions are equal on the y-axis when y is two and also negative two, okay? If I substitute these values into either equation, let's just say the first one, it'll tell me the x values for when they're equal. So I'm gonna take plus and minus two. I chose the first one because it's the easiest. I could have chose the second one, but this has less calculations, right? So I'm gonna plug in plus or minus two for where I see y in my first function. And then when I solve this, it doesn't matter that this is plus or minus. I don't have to look at them as two separate cases because when I square a positive, I get a positive. When I square a negative, I get a negative. So for both cases, this is just gonna be four times two will give me eight, okay? So when X is equal to eight, these two functions are equal to each other. So I have eight and positive two and eight and negative two are my points of intersection here. If I were to have gone ahead and plugged it into my separate, uh, my second function for y equals plus or minus two, it would look like this and it would be very, very similar, right? Two squared is four plus four is eight. So I'm just double checking to make sure that it makes sense for both functions, which it should if I did my math correct when I set them equal to each other. Um, so this just kind of validates that I found the correct points of intersection, okay? So for part two, I wanna draw pictures. A rough sketch is okay. So let's think about the, what these are, right? So again, this is probably the first time we've had a graph of function that looks like this. Normally we're graphing functions that look like the following, right? Y equals X squared is a parabola. We know that this was a shifted parabola. So whenever we have a function in Y, it's the same thing, it's just now along the X axis instead of the Y axis, right? So we're kind of rotating everything by 90 degrees. Let's go back a step. Right, so the graphs of these functions are parabolas, but they are centered on the X axis instead of being centered on the Y axis. So what I mean by that is the line of symmetry runs left to right instead of up and down. Right, so it runs along x. So x equals 2y squared is really, really, really similar to just x squared, except for translated, right? So it's very, very similar to y equals 2x squared, but again, the line of symmetry is on the x axis left to right instead of up and down. So we're just rotating that clockwise 90 degrees. If we think about the second function here, it's the same thing, it's a parabola, it's just been shifted forward by four units. So our first function, two y squared, will look like this, okay? Don't mind this, it's just how this uh, thing kind of graphs things. Sometimes it's not as smooth as it should look, but it's a regular parabola here. So again, if this was y equals two x squared, it would look like that, um, like this. We're rotating at 90 degrees. It's a little bit thinner than a regular parabola because it has a, a an amplitude, right? It's being multiplied by two. Here, this is the regular y squared, but I'm shifting it up four units. If I rotated to this 90 degrees, it would be the same thing. It would start at four and it would open upwards, okay? So what I've done here is you rotate it 90 degrees. So my x values are four, they start at four, and then whatever my y value is gets added onto that four, right? So here, this would be like one, one, 
and add it to 4, which is why I get an x value of 5 here. So it's the same, 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 same parabola. It's just now centered along x-axis. One thing that might help you to graph these is if you turn your head. I can't actually turn my screen for you guys, but if you turned your head to the side, to the right, so that this looks like it's up and down, you would see what I'm talking about, and it looks like it's just a regular old graph focused on y. So you're doing the exact same graphs that you would normally do, oops, but you're focusing it on y. Okay, so I have my points of intersection, which I know happen at 8. Okay, so they happen at 8, and it happens when my y value is positive 2 and when my y value is negative 2. So that lines up with what I expected to happen. And this is the area that I'm looking for. Okay, this is the area bounded by the two curves. This is the larger function, because again, if you turn your head to your right and you look at this as if it was the y-axis instead of the x-axis, this would be the larger valued function on top. Okay, And this 2y squared would be the lower function because it's lower down on the axis. Right. So now I know which one is my larger function, which one is my smaller function, and my slices, okay, are horizontal instead of up and down. I'm not taking up and down slices. I am integrating along y. So I'm starting at y equals negative 2, and I will integrate upwards to y equals 2. So again, if it confuses you, kind of tilt your head to the side and imagine this now as the x-axis and this as the y-axis, and it should help you out a little bit. Okay, It gets easier and easier with practice. And we do a lot of these, okay? There's a lot of functions where we we turn things sideways like this. So <clears throat> I'm going to make my slice this way, okay? So meaning that since this is the larger valued function, it's the area from the y-axis up until its point on the red function. If I subtract uh, the value of the blue function, It'll take this value away, and it leaves me with this um, value lengthwise here instead. So I'm going to take this function and subtract this function when I create my integral. So that's what my slice is going to look like. It goes from the smaller function to the larger value function. It has a width of delta y, okay? because again, we are integrating upwards. okay? And if I subtract these two functions, 4 plus y squared minus 2y squared, I get, so y squared, mi so 1 minus 2 is a negative 1, right? So I have this 4 minus y squared is the function I will be integrating. Okay. And again, it's the same thing. Same kind of setup. I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity, meaning I'm making delta y get infinitesimally small, which will give me more and more and more of these bars, okay, of these rectangles. And the height of these rectangles, or in this case, I guess we could call it the width, is the value of one function minus the value of another function. And that's how I get the length there. Okay, and then delta y is that height, I guess in this case. And so when we take that limit, we know it equals the integral from our lower bound to our upper bound, in this case, negative two to positive two, right, these points of intersection with one function minus the other function, which in this case is 4 minus y squared. Now again, remember, I could just integrate this, and I could just integrate this over the two bounds and then subtract it, but it's very, very easy to just subtract them right away into one single function and then integrate. Right? So here, again, we integrate with respect to y. An indicator that we do that is that we do not have functions, right? Technically, these are not functions. They do not pass the horse, the vertical line test, right? They're, they're technically not a function, right? They are relations in terms of y. But for simplicity, we're just going to call them functions in y. So our area then is the integral from negative 2 to 2. 4 minus y squared, again, which is what I found uh, by subtracting those two functions, the larger one minus the
smaller one. Okay. If I integrate this with respect to y, I get 4y. This turns into a 3, and it drops down to the 1 third, and my bounds are from 2 to negative 2. I have to evaluate at both. So throwing in the larger one, I'm going to get 8. Um, right, 2 minus 4 is 8, minus 8 over 3. Okay. Subtracted by, and I'm going to throw a negative 2. So this will be a negative 8 here, and this will be a positive 8 over 3, because it's a negative and a negative. So when I subtract these, I get 8 minus a negative 8. So that turns into 16. And I will get a negative minus a positive here. Uh, sorry, so this will turn into plus or minus. So I get basically, I can just double one of these, right? So it's 16 um, and, minus, and 16, 16 minus 16 over 3. Okay, I need a common denominator. So basically triple this, so it'll be 48 over 3 minus 16 over 3, so that should be 32 over 3. Okay. So that is my function. Now, did I have to do it in terms of y? I know I had this whole setup about, you know, the indicators for how to do this. I'm turning it 90 degrees. I don't actually have functions. So it's, you know, I'm taking one larger function minusing a smaller function. Now, the answer is, did I have to do it in y? No. I could have done it in X, but it is definitely more convoluted to do so. And we will take a look at that. Okay. So, no, I could have sectioned off my graph into multiple sub integrals. I could have also used symmetry in doing so to make my life a little bit easier, which we'll do um, in order to find the area. Okay. So, what we would need to do is I would need to change these functions of Y into functions of X. So look at the amount of work I had to do just as a, a preview, right, in order to find this integral. It wasn't a lot. It takes a lot of conceptual understanding, right? I had to set these functions equal to each other. I found the points of intersection. It gave me my bounds. Um, a nice drawing of the graph is helpful, but it's not necessary. Um, okay, but then once I got myself together, the work wasn't very difficult at all, right? It's really just a little bit of integration, very easy arithmetic. So if I want to put these into functions of x, I do run across some problems that make it algebraically much more difficult. Um, one being I need to section off my graph into multiple integrals. Uh, so it's always easier just to do one integral than like four. Um, I also need to change my functions. I need to inverse my functions and have y equal something instead of x equal something. And that can be very difficult, especially if my functions are parabolas, right? So let's go ahead and do this. Um, we would start by dividing the graph into sections that can be integrated by using uh, functions in x instead of functions in y, right? So what I would do is if we just kind of look at the top function here, I would need to split this somewhere where I kind of have one function and then like another setup, okay? So this line here, okay, would allow me to integrate, if I change this around to y equals something, I have one function that I can integrate um, just for this top part. For the second part, I could find the area between these two curves, like I did previously, um, larger function minus the second function, and then I'd have to do that on the bottom as well. I would take this second function here, and I would need to integrate it to find the area from the function to the axis. And then I would do the same thing I did above to find the area on the bottom. An even easier way would just to be to do this once to find this area in this area and then double it, right? That's using the symmetry and the geometry of our situation, which is what we're going to do. Okay. So in order to do this first, I got to change our functions into four different functions. Now you might say, why four functions? There's only two here. Yeah, you guys, but this does not pass the vertical line test, right? Which means it is not a function. So if I do turn them into functions of y, or x, I'm sorry, this, okay, this would be one function. This would be a second function. This would be a third function. And this would be a fourth function because there would not be one function to give me the whole thing. Uh, Let's give an example, okay? Abracadabra. 
Okay, and so through the power of the internet, we are now here in Desmos. So for example, I can give us something like y equals oops, x squared, okay? But if I wanna translate that onto the y-axis, I cannot have a single function. I need to have something like y equals square root of x, also have to have a second function y equals negative square root of x in order to translate this and rotate this onto the y-axis right so if I want to make this a little cohesive uh, sorry it's trying to change the color there we go okay now it looks like a single function right in order to do this <clears throat> I have to give myself two functions, right? So we generally write this as just do they have plus minus? I don't think they do a plus minus in Desmos. I'm sure I have to do it through a calculator. Um, I don't think they have a plus minus. Okay, so it doesn't really matter, but you see I have to have two separate functions. Um, sorry you guys just bear with me yeah so even Desmos doesn't have a plus minus function so I would have to do right uh, two different functions in order to have this work okay. so in order to make this happen I need two functions right so that's the problem that we run into. Instead of just dealing with this as uh, x equals y squared as a single function, I now have to deal with it as two separate functions. Just to show the contrast, I have one function and two functions versus just a single function in terms of y. And we're back, okay? so. <clears throat> Look, so again, our two functions change into four functions, okay? I have one function here, a second function here, this becomes two, this becomes two. So if I take my first function, x equals two y squared, and I solve for y, I'm gonna subtract one half, um, and then take the square root of both sides, so that gives me plus or minus, um, square root one half x, so that's two functions. And I do the same thing here, I solve for y, so I subtract four and take the square root, which gives me a plus or minus function, the positive form and the negative form. So now my two functions turn into four functions, okay? In order to find the integral, our area is now gonna be the following. I need to go from zero to four of square root one half x dx. Why do I go zero to four? Well, look here, right? This function here is the top part of this square root one half, uh, y squared, x squared, I guess, and that, and that x, just x, sorry. It goes from 0 to 4, and then the next function will go from 4 to 8, because now I'm integrating along x, right? So that first half goes from 0 to 4, and then I do a subtraction between two functions from 4 to 8, and then I would have to do the same thing with the bottom functions, the negative forms, from 0 to 4, and then from 4 to 8. Functions. So the first one is 0 to 4 of the positive form for the top function. I'm going to add that to the area from 4 to 8 of the top function minus the bottom function. So again, I'm using the positive form of the bottom function, but I need the area between them. So I'm subtracting them. Okay. So that's the top half. The bottom half, which also needs to be found and added to it, will give me... Um, 0 to 4, I'm adding because I'm taking the area, okay? So you would say, oh, wouldn't you be subtracting? I'm taking a positive value because I am adding. So I'm not going to add the negative form because adding the negative form will take away from the area. So I'm actually kind of using the positive, uh, the absolute value. And so I'm doing the same thing here. So it kind of gets repeated. Okay, so again, I'm finding the area bound between the curves. So I need to take all the areas as positive values, right? So if I add 
and then I put a negative value here, it's just going to negate that, that addition, right? Because we know that the areas under the curve are always negative. So I got to change their value because now it's a physical value, it's an area. And I don't want them to negate each other. I need to add them to each other. So we're taking them as positive values, okay? Um, the symmetry is going to allow us to condense it by just multiplying the first half times two, which is what I was saying here. Because if we look at this, if I took this, you know, as the positive form and the negative form, it would just get zero because this positive area and then this area under the curve would cancel each other out. And that's not what I'm trying to do. So I need to count this as a positive thing. So again, it's much easier just to find this top half and then double it. And so that's what I mean by condensing our integral down by using the symmetry. Okay, so I'm just going to take the first half from 0 to 4 and then 4 to 8. And if you notice, it's the exact same thing anyways, right? So I'm just kind of adding it together, which is would be the same thing as taking the first half and doubling it, right? So here I'm just condensing it down to make it a little bit easier. This still looks a lot harder. Doing square roots is not as fun as doing standard integration, especially for something like this. This we know is just to the one half power, so it's not hard to integrate that. But when we have something like this, we have to start using substitutions and things like that, right? So we're going to use the substitution u equals 4 minus x for this last part here, okay? The du value here is going to be equal to our dx because, again, when I differentiate this, this turns into negative x. I'm sorry, just negative dx. But I don't want a negative dx. I want the value of dx for when I make my substitution. So I'll move the negative sign for du. Okay. So I'm also going to separate this. This first half stays the same. I pull out the common term of or the, the constant value of square root 1 half to the outside, which leaves me with square root x on the inside, dx. I'm not doing nothing to this, but pulling out the constant. This integral, I'm separating into two separate integrals. The integral of 1 half x dx, which I then also simplified by pulling out the constant term, again, from 4 to 8. And then this as something different, okay, as its own integral, which, which is why I put the bounds here for x equals 4, x equals 8, because now I'm in the world of u, but I didn't feel like changing my bounds. I'm just going to keep them in x as I work, which you've seen in chapter 7, where I'm lazy, so I don't change these to u. I just keep them in x, and I change, like to change my variable back to x before I, I substitute back, right? So here, this was a negative, but it's plus now because my du is negative. So this minus turns into a plus. The square root 4 minus x is what my u is, so I got square root of u. So I just got a square root x, square root x, square root u, and I pulled out my constants, and I have all of my stuff. Now, I could do something cool here because this integral and this integral are exactly the same, but over different bounds. And so now I get to combine these as a single integral from 0 to 8 because the integrand is exactly the same. And there's no discontinuity here or anything weird to keep me from doing that. Okay, So now I can condense this down into a single integral from 0 to 8. And this one still continues from x is 4 to x equals 8 in this u form, okay? So I'm gonna do that. This is gonna go from zero to eight. I don't write it explicitly, but again, I'm talking you through it. And then I'm just gonna integrate this, right? So I know this turns into, this is one half and we go up one. So that's three halves. So this will be two thirds on the outside. Okay, so you might say, why is it four thirds? Because there's this two here, right? So that turns into four thirds, x to the three halves, square root one half, and I'm going from 0 to 8. So again, I kind of just condensed this into 0 to 8 because it's the same integrand. I just didn't write it, but I'm telling you what happened. So hopefully you're actually watching this video and not just going off of our lecture notes and being like, what the hell just happened, right? Our second form is very, very standard, right? So it integrates the same way. There's just no square root 1 half term. Uh, because I didn't have it once I made the substitution. Okay. And again, I'm still in u, but my bounds to evaluate are in x, so I'm going to resubstitute this u um, as well as evaluate here. So again, if I plug in 8, if I plug in 0, first notice that this whole thing goes away. 
So really what I'm doing is I'm just plugging in 8, but I'm also being a little slick here. Square root of 1 half is 2 to the negative 1 half power, right? I still have 4 thirds. This is 2 to the negative 1 half power. If I turn this into terms of 2, right, x is 2 thirds to the 3 half powers. So I just put everything in the same base so that I can combine my powers with simple addition and multiplication. Here, I'm going to resubstitute first before I do anything, before I evaluate. Okay. So if we look at this, I'm going to have 4 thirds. I'm going to have 2, so 3 to the 3 halves. That's 9 halves. And I'm going to add that to negative 1, so that, or sorry, negative half. So that's 8 halves. So this is really going to be 2 to the 4. Okay, 4 thirds. This simplifies to 2 to the 4th. 16. Here, without even looking at the 8, notice when I plug in 4, this is 4 minus 4, so this goes to 0. I only have to plug in the 8 value. 4 minus 8 is a negative 4. Okay, so I have 4 thirds, negative 4 to the 3 halves. I can kind of change this up and think about it as uh, negative 2 squared if I need to, but um, I don't know how much it'll help me because of this. So 16 times 4 is 64 over 3. Here, I'm going to change this to a negative value of 2 to the 2. So this is 64. This turns into negative uh, 32 over 3. Again, 2 times 3 is um, 6. 6 over 4, I'm sorry, 6 over 2 is 3. So this would be a negative 2 cubed, okay? 2 cubed is uh, 8. 8 times 4 is 32. Okay, so just a little bit of quick mental math there. And it's negative because this is treated like an odd power, right? So it goes negative, positive, negative. But there's a square root there. So then this is what we have, okay? Find this when we do the subtraction, we get 32 over 3, which is if we come all the way backwards, the same thing that we had before. Okay, so um, was that more difficult? I don't it's not that it's more difficult, but it was definitely more work, right? Here we set them equal, we found our bounds, we subtracted the two functions, and then we integrated fairly straightforward. Here, uh, we had to find the inverses of both of our functions. We had to set up four integrals. Um, and then we had to do a little bit of extra math to try to condense them down using some properties of integration. We're able to break this down to just kind of two um, integrals. So we're kind of still left with three. We had to do a u substitution. And then the math here was maybe a little bit more difficult. Um, because we're doing fractional powers. However, if your algebra is good, then it's not really a big deal. But we still get down to the same value, right? So we can't integrate in terms of a different uh, direction. It's, most of the time, it's not easier. Um, depends on the functions that we're given. Sometimes it can be almost impossible, right? So it really just depends. So <clears throat> what if we wanted to look at the points beyond intersection. So if you kind of look at this graph that we have here, yeah, this is the area that's bound between the two curves. But if we're looking at it in terms of like up and down x and y, this is also an area bound between the two curves. So what if I wanted to look beyond this terms of intersection? What would that look like? Or how would we do that? Okay, so if we come back here, so if we want to find the area bound by two curves over a larger interval, just not the given what we would think of as boundaries, um, then we have to use the following formula. We need to use the absolute value of the difference between the two functions over a to b. Okay. So here our steps are the same, except that we need to find every point of intersection. And through each interval, we have to determine which function is larger over each interval, okay? So an example, 
Let's say I want to find the area between y is cosine of x and 1 minus cosine of x over the interval from 0 to pi. Again, I could extend this to, these are both um, oscillating functions. So what if I went, let's say, from 0 to like 10 pi, right? I have to find every point of intersection and each time figure out which one is on top, and I would set up several intervals. So uh, first things first is we need to see if there's any points of intersection within our given interval. Okay. So we're going to set our two functions equal to, to each other. Cosine of x is 1 minus cosine of x. I obviously would like to zero them out, so I will move all the cosines to one side. Um, so that'll be uh, 2 cosine uh, of x equals 1, and then I could divide that and get 1 half. This is a trig function, so I don't necessarily need to zero it out if I don't have to. Um, 2 cosine of x minus 1 equals 0 is very difficult, right, because it's a trig function. But I can figure out when cosine of x equals 1 half by using the inverse cosine function, which actually has really nice values. So the times that happen is pi over 3, 5 pi over 3, 7 pi over 3, 11 pi over 3, so forth and so forth. So I'd really just look at my unit circle. Um, if I didn't know how to figure this out without the unit circle, um, you know, just look at the unit circle for the times when um, our x value on the unit circle is 1 half. Right? So between 0 and pi, pi over 3 is the only point of intersection inside of that interval. Okay. So let's kind of look at a rough sketch of both graphs. So we'll do a rough graph sketch. Um, we know that regular cosine starts at 1. So 1 minus cosine would be us starting at 1, um, but doing a negative cosine, right? So that would be 1 minus 1 would start at 0 for the other one. So let's start with regular cosine. Okay. The graph of 1 minus cosine is the graph of negative cosine, again, shifted up by 1. So our graph would look like this, right? So a regular cosine graph is not difficult to find. And then for uh, the shifted graph, instead of starting at 1, I would do the negative. So I would be at negative 1, and then I shift up by 1, so I start at 0. So from 0 to pi, this is what I want to look at. So again, I kind of have two different breakdowns. Here, cosine is on top. Throughout this interval, 1 minus cosine is on top. So I have to set up two different integrals in order to find this. Okay, so to set this up, I need the area from 0 to pi of cosine of x minus 1 minus cosine of x, absolute value. So doing that subtraction, if I take out um, the interval, the absolute value from 0 to pi over 3, my first point of intersection, I know cosine, cosine is the function on top. And on the second one, from pi over 3 to pi, 1 minus cosine is the function on top. So here, from 0 to pi over 3, cosine first minus the second. And from pi over 3 to pi, it's 1 minus cosine minus cosine. Okay. So if I do my simplifications, if I combine my like terms and all that, I have 2 cosine minus 1, and here 1 minus cosine, uh, 1 minus 2 cosine. Cosine turns into sine, 1 will turn into x, okay? This 1 will turn into x, and this will turn into 2 sine as well, okay? So from here, um, we just evaluate. Sine starts at 0, so this 0 value doesn't do anything here. This value doesn't do anything here. And for 2 sine of x, my pi is also 0. So that also does nothing to me, and I just need to evaluate a pi over 3. Okay, So we'll just kind of do this uh, one at a time. So for the first one, I plug in pi over 3. Because when I plug in 0, nothing happens. For x, I plug in pi over 3. Because when I plug in 0, nothing happens. Here, I will add pi. I will subtract pi over 3. Here, when I plug in pi, it goes to 0. So I will subtract a negative 
2 sine pi over 3. So this becomes a positive value. So you can see I have some values that double. So this pi over 3 plus um, or minus this pi over 3, I'm sorry, turns into a negative 2 pi over 3. And I get a 4 sine pi over 3 plus a pi. Okay. And so when I evaluate uh, at pi over 3, I can just simplify this to, uh, to root 3 because sine pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And I have four of them. So it cancels and leaves me a 2. Um, and then when I add pi, when I take pi and I subtract 2 pi over 3, I'm left with a positive pi over 3. And so this is my final exact answer. Okay. Thank you guys. I hope this was helpful. I will see you in the next video for section uh, 8.2.